Let's go ahead and start off the service. Let's stand in this place.
Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. Here we go. Blessed be your name. In a land that is plentiful. The streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. 
shout of the king. Here we go.
lifting up needs, amen, and we're uh, just believing God in this wonderful atmosphere, amen, of the presence of God, amen, we're praying, uh, amen, for the rest of our conference, we're believing God for great things, every seminar, every sermon, every altar call, uh, that things would happen, amen, beyond just the natural, amen, that God would move uh, in every heart and His will would be accomplished, amen, so let's pray for that, uh, let's pray for Pastor Campbell as he preaches tonight, amen, that he brings the word of God, amen, let's pray that it would be a word from heaven to every heart in this place, amen, so let's pray for all of this, amen, how many of you are in this place, you have needs upon your own heart, you want to sing that by raising your hand, amen, God sees your hand, God knows your need, and you place that in the hands of God, how many know God can move in any circumstance, amen, so uh, you believe God for your need, uh, believe God for all the needs around you, let's believe God for all this, uh, and as we subside in prayer, Pastor Danny Hernandez from Horizon City, Texas, is going to come open us in prayer, let's get a hold of God right now, let's pray, hallelujah, God, we come before your throne, Jesus, hallelujah, we're asking God for God, your miracle working power to move Oh, thank you, thank you, Jesus, for your goodness, God, your grace, your mercy that you've shown to us, Lord. We come before you a desperate and needy people, my God. Oh, we ask you, God, to intervene, to move, God, to strengthen, to restore the way places, God. Shake the foundations, the strongholds of the enemy, God. We're asking you, Lord God, to renew your servants, Father God. We submit our lives, our spouse, our family, our children, our churches to you, God. Have right of way, my my God, may the name of Jesus be glorified and may his name be great among the nations. We give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Why don't we greet one another as we take our seats? Amen. Hallelujah. We want to welcome everyone out to the second night, amen, of our 
Bible conference, amen. And how many know if, even if it was all we've heard is what we've heard up to now, amen, it would be all worth it, amen. But thank God we're just getting started. We're at the beginning of the week, amen. And thank God there's still much more to come, amen. Praise God. Welcome to the service, amen. Uh, delegates, pastors from around the world, uh, those that are live streaming, amen. Welcome to the service, amen. I know there's people from around the world right now that are tuned in watching this, amen. So, Welcome to the service, amen. Let's give everyone a very warm welcome right now. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. We have some announcements very quickly just so you can know what's uh, going on over the next couple of days. First, we do want to announce that we have pastor's pictures. Uh, that's in the main hallway. Uh, so uh, th they'll be ready to take pictures from 6 o'clock till about 6.45 or so. Uh, so uh, we ask all the pastors, evangelists, uh, staff, amen, if you can take your picture so we can have a current picture and not one from the 1970s, amen. So uh, if we can do that and help us with that, that'd be uh, tremendous. Amen. Uh, also, immediately after uh, the last seminar tomorrow, we will be having a pastor's business meeting. So uh, we ask everyone to clear out as soon as possible. And then here in the main sanctuary, we will be having that business meeting. Then that will be followed by a lunch, amen. So uh, for all the pastors, evangelists, uh, and staff, amen, so that'll be tomorrow, uh, also uh, tomorrow night, there will be a group picture, amen, so I'll give some more instructions on that, and exactly how the logistics of that will work, uh, but just to uh, remind you, amen, tomorrow, immediately after the night service, we're going to make our way into the fellowship hall, and, uh, and I'll have instructions, but uh, children will be taken care of, they'll be brought in and then taken back, and all of that will be worked out, uh, but just to uh, uh, have that uh, in your memory for tomorrow, amen. Uh, also, uh, if, you are be, uh, if you will be giving via app or text, uh, there will be some prompts for each evening. Tonight it will be CT, which stands for Conference Tuesday, amen. So every night will be a different prompt. Uh, and so if you're giving via online, amen, just uh, take note of that, amen, and give to the according uh, day of the conference, amen. Uh, also, um, uh, Friday at 6.30 in the morning, this is going to be for all pastors that are serious, amen. We do serious men's classes, it's going to be for serious pastors, amen. We will be having a question and answer uh, with Pastor Greg Mitchell, 6.30 in the morning on Friday, amen. So uh, for all those men, uh, pastors that want to be involved in that, uh, that's going to be at 6.30 Friday morning. Uh, then that Friday in the afternoon, this is going to be after the morning seminars uh, this will give you a little bit of time to go get some lunch two o'clock in the afternoon pastor ernie lopez will be giving a seminar on why preach and teach on bible prophecy many of you know pastor ernie is a he's one of the experts in that uh, in that field amen has all kinds of knowledge about this and and so he's got some things to say about this and and so uh, we encourage you to be a part of that uh, that will be open to anyone that wants to come the importance of Bible prophecy, amen, that's going to be on Friday at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, amen, so make note of that, uh, tomorrow we have a great lineup, amen, we have prayer from 8 to 9 in the morning, and uh, we've been uh, pushing for this, uh, this is uh, one of the foundations of a conference is prayer, amen, so we encourage you to be here, thank God, uh, uh, yes, uh, this morning actually it was, it was uh, you could hear people crying out to God, so we want that to continue, uh, 8 to 9 o'clock prayer. And then we have as a lineup, uh, Bobby Perez, Renee Barra, and Pastor yeah. Gary King. Amen. So it's going to be a wonderful, wonderful morning tomorrow morning. Hallelujah. Amen. So make note of that. Amen. A couple of other announcements. Amen. Please, no food or drinks in the main sanctuary. Uh, if you happen to bring water bottles, you can bring water, but please pick up your water bottles as you leave. Amen. Don't just leave them thrown around. Uh, and also after the morning, uh, in the, during the break of the morning seminars, uh, please do not bring food into the main sanctuary. Amen. So uh, we have some very tough cleaning ladies. Amen. It'll take care of you. Amen. So, uh, no, but please don't bring uh, uh, that into the main sanctuary. Please keep that all in the fellowship hall. Uh, and also, uh, after song service, seats will be, uh, if you're saving a seat after song service, uh, those seats will be taken, amen. So uh, if your uh, friend or whoever you're holding that for, uh, if they haven't been here by the end of the song service, amen, then we're going to take those seats, amen. So also take note of that. And uh, I believe those are all the announcements. Amen. We do have some reports. How many are ready for some reports? Praise God. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh, 
Uh, we're going to have a video report from Gabriel Reese from Bucaramanga, Colombia. I mean, let's watch that right now. Hallelujah. Hello, everyone. My name is Gabriel, uh, and my wife and I, his name is Melissa, and then my son, Alexander, and, and my daughter, Scarlett, we're pioneering in the great city of Bucaramanga. Yes, you heard that right. It's Bucaramanga, Colombia. It's a real city, and it's a city that needs Jesus. We've been here now uh, going on two months. Uh, we took over the work from Ben and Magali Lopez. Uh, they're out of uh, Prescott, Arizona. You know, they've already been here for about a year, a year and a half or so, so we took it over the last Prescott conference uh, and uh, taking it over, you know, it's been such a big blessing. Uh, ben and Magali did a great job here in this city. Uh, you know, we came in, uh, we have a vehicle, uh, we have an apartment, uh, we have uh, also a, a building. So all we had to do was just come in uh, and get to work. So we started doing that. We started witnessing, uh, uh, believing in God that God was going to bring people. Uh, and so we've been going to the parks, uh, uh, preaching the gospel, inviting people, witnessing to people uh, uh, here in the city. It's called the city of parks so there's parks that are here are beautiful and many times in these parks there's about 300 to 400 people every single Saturday so that's what we do we go to the parks we preach we witness to people and the city is super open we've been having visitors um, almost every single Sunday night uh, one in particular his name is Johan he's a young man he's 19 years old and we witness to him outside of our church building and uh, this young man Little did I know that God was already speaking to him. Uh, he told me a little bit a little bit later, but that day that I invited him, um, he was he had just gotten out of, out of rehab. He didn't know what to do with his life. In his in rehab, he gave his life to Christ. And so when he was on his way home, he had just gotten out. Uh, he was talking to his mom about finding a church. So that same day that I gave him a flyer and I told him to come to church, he had just gotten out and he said that God was speaking to him to come to the church. He came. Uh, one one Sunday and God saved him and now he's been coming to almost every single service. God is doing a miracle here in this city. God is bringing people. God is saving the lost and also God is stirring the people that already have been here. You know one of the main couples, Miguel and Tatiana, they've been such a blessing to us and we've seen God speak to them. We've seen God putting them in fire, on fire for, the, for his things and for his will. You know they come out with us every single hour reach. Uh, you know, we're believing in God that God is going to move in this city. Please uh, continue to pray for us. Uh, we're believing in God for great things. We're believing in God for a greater report uh, uh, for next conference. Uh, please pray for us as we pray for you. Uh, again, I want to thank uh, uh, Pastor Stevens and Pastor Contreras uh, for trusting us to come uh, to this great city. Uh, uh, thank you again, El Paso Church, for your investment. Uh, I thank God every day that you guys give. Uh, because of your giving, we are here. Uh, thank Thank you, everyone. I have a great conference. Amen. These men are going to come in this order. They're going to give their name, their wife's name, the city that they are laboring in, and what God is doing in their city. Amen. They're going to come in this order. Amen. Alex Rodriguez, Ted Ramirez, Randy Jaramillo, Juan Sustersik, Ernesto Estrada, and Roger Dirk. Amen. Let's receive our brother Alex. Amen. Hey Amen. My name is Alex Rodriguez. My wife and I, we pastor in, well, I pastor. She's with me. Uh, we're in Castleberry, Florida. Sometimes she tells me what to say, but not a lot of times. Uh, but we've had amazing revivals uh, this last year. We had Ernie Toppin, Tim Miller, Glenn Puglisi. Uh, when every one of those revivals, we had visitors. People got saved. Uh, when evangelist Glenn Puglisi was there, my seven-year-old daughter, Zayla, she got filled with the Holy Ghost. Uh, she is uh, speaking in tongues every time she gets sick. I say, you better speak in tongues. Uh, and so so she, God is working a miracle there. On our regular outreaches, we go to Walmart because in Florida, it's very humid. And so I don't like the heat. They don't like the heat. And so we go inside. And what's great is it's always local people. And we're not just passing out flyers. We're witnessing to people. People are praying while they're shopping for milk, cereal. They're there. They're bowing their head. They're leading in prayer. We're getting their phone numbers. We're able to follow up on them, work with them. It's an amazing thing. In one of those outreaches, we had a new convert. He asked if he could make a sign that said, that said free prayer and take it with us, and he would stand outside. And I said, why not? I've never tried it. He did that, and he had a group of people coming because we live in a broken world. We, people are desperate for prayer. They're looking for answers. And so it was amazing to see that people will respond 
by a little cardboard sign that he made and they would come uh, and ask for prayer. We're making noise, outdoor concerts out in the street. People are pulling over. We're seeing miracles in that. We're also praying for young people. Just recently, one of the couples in our church, they told me uh, they were going to leave prayer a little bit early and they were going to pick somebody up. And in my desperation, and I prayed, I said, God, please let it be a young person. And sure enough, when they did, it was a young single mom with her two kids. They've continued to come to church. God is working in their lives. And so we're seeing God bring an influx of people. Just this last month and a half, we've seen our church on Sunday mornings almost double. Uh, it's been an amazing experience to see God work in Florida. Our converts are bringing people. They're getting saved. Lives are being touched. We had a young man or an older man. He came to our church. Uh, he was looking for guidance and counseling his marriage is on the rocks. He's fighting his, with his wife. We were the only church that's open. He came and he said, can you help me? Can you give me counseling? And I said, are you born again? And he said, no. He said, I, I can't help you. And he looked at me dumbfounded thinking, why not? I said, because I can't do anything. You need Jesus and Jesus can save your marriage. He prayed right in my office. He's been faithful every Sunday morning to our services. He's coming. He's saying, I know one day my wife and my son, they're going to come to church and they're going to get saved because that's what we're doing. We're, we're leading people to Jesus. They're getting saved and touched. And so we're very grateful for the El Paso congregation. We thank you for all that you've done, your support. It is touching the nations. It's touching Florida. Florida is a nation. You have Florida man. And so God is working there. Pray for us. Thank you, Pastor Stevens, Sister Renee. We appreciate all that you do. Amen. My name is Ter Ramirez, my beautiful wife, Gabriela. We're in the most beautiful city of the Republica Mexicana. Uh, we simply uh, we're going to tell the truth. We were having drought. You know, I, I was thinking, you know, the wells that we dug, they were covered again. But I cried out to God. I said, God, you need to visit us. You need to bring life to our lives again. I said, we need to change the building. I, took, I challenged the church. I said, church, we got to move from this building. We haven't seen visitors in a while. I shouted him out. My disciple, he came with us from Etepec. He's here with his wife. And uh, he told me, Pastor, I found a building. I said, you know, Jeho Jehovah Jireh is going to provide because I said, I don't have for the down payment. I said, call him up and uh, do an appointment. He did that. We went, and I told the lady, how much do you want for the building? I said, I love it. It's great. It's in a great area. She said, we want 15,000 pesos. I said, okay. The only thing I could give you is 10000 for it. And I said, she said, maybe it sounds like a joke, but uh, I'm going to offer it to the owner. I said, okay, let me know. And then she calls uh, Alejandro, my disciple. She said, yeah, they're going to leave it for 10, but you have to pay the taxes. And I said, nope. Told her that we could only afford 10,000 pesos for that. And she said, okay. She called back. Let's do it. So God opened doors. And let me just tell you something really shifted. I remember the, the words of evangelist Roger Rodriguez. He told me, God wants me to tell you, you haven't lost dominion in this area. Because that's the, the way I felt. But let me tell you a quick picture. Uh, we had uh, the end times with Ernie Lopez. Uh, he did a great time to stir up the church. But this guy, Federico, in the yellow jacket, uh, he works for the Poder Judicial in, in Toluca for the government. He has never came to a church. He came to a revival with Carlos Salazar from the Patlaco Church. He gave his life to Christ. I mean, uh, he works 9 09 from Monday to Friday. Uh, I saw him on Wednesday, sir. I'm like, what the heck? And then he told uh, Alejandro, he's his barber. He told him, you know what? Uh, I lied. You know, the line's not good, but when they say they're coming uh, to church, it's no problem. I and mean, he said, my mom was sick. And I said, praise God, amen. And he told his wife, you know what? Uh, his mom, I'm sorry. He told him, he told her, you know what? I found my God in my life. And his name is Jesus. They called him up for, uh, to party. He was a guy uh, that was partying all the time. He said, no. They called him again. He said, you know what? Are you going to come with us? He said, no, why not? I'm going to church now. They said, we're not going to be your friend no more. He said, I don't, I don't care about it. I have new friends now with Jesus. Amen. So keep on praying for us in Metepec. And I want to thank Pastor Stevens for his confidence, uh, Sister Renee, and the whole congregation. God bless you.
Praise God. My name is Randy Jaramillo, my wife Annette, three boys, Joshua, Justin, Jordan. We are pastoring in Indianapolis, Indiana. I want to tell you that God is moving. We had our grand opening on January 28th, and in preparation for that grand opening, we had invasion teams from Illinois and Ohio and Indiana, and we began to outreach in negative six degree weather. And so, oh, we had Wisconsin. Pat Vince was there. He was my buddy. I'm making him go door to door with me at negative six. And so, we just began to outreach. And I said, God, you got to move. You got to bring people. The, ne- the Sunday that we opened, we had 26 people in attendance, and it has not slowed down at all. And I want to tell you, we're getting people from the nations of the world. I think right now we have 10, 11 nations coming in. We have people translating in the Burmese language. We have people translating into Spanish. Uh, God's truly, truly moving. People are starting to come to outreach. Uh, We're going to be starting Bible studies when I get back. Uh, People are hungry for God. Uh, You know, we're having a Easter cookout, and I began to, uh, you know, ask for help. We need sides, and about five ladies went to my wife, says, we want to help out, and they're wanting to get involved. A couple of notable things. Uh, Pastor Bob McCullough in Houston had somebody visit him and uh, for a few services and in the midst of that conversation he mentioned that I was in Indianapolis. The guy had a friend there, gave me his number. I called him uh, and he came our grand opening and I want to tell you that this family was an absolute mess but they came, they got saved, and all of a sudden, God's restoring their marriage, restoring their mind. He sent me a text uh, at 5 in the morning the other day and said, Pastor, God's moving in my life, uh, my marriage. He's setting me free from all of the bondages. Uh, we're seeing things like that happen. Uh, we had a lady come to me this last Sunday. She's like, Pastor, I didn't come this morning. Uh, can I confess? Uh, I went to a club, and I don't want to do that no more. Just uh, And she's just praying. They're coming to the altar. Every service, almost every single person, Person is coming praying at the altar I'm telling you God is doing wonderful wonderful things uh, Indianapolis is known as the crossroads uh, to the country well we're going to believe God that it's going to be the crossroads to the nations of the world uh, you know I want to thank Pastor Stevens and his wife Renee and his all-star staff as he always says and which is true Pastor Richard and Luz Pastor Ernie and Sandra what there's been incredible I you just call them and they're always there just thank the El Paso congregation for you always always giving and supporting people all over the world are grateful for you amen Amen. praise God my name is uh, Juan Sostrasik my uh, wife of 38 years and I are we're uh, pastoring over there in Tehuacan Puebla and we've been there 11 years. Can you believe that? 11 years. Uh, we've seen uh, uh, the last uh, few years, we've been seeing uh, a tremendous grow, tremendous grow in the church and in all the churches around the area. We have, I uh, think, about 14 churches uh, uh, right under the El Paso uh, congregation. And they all, uh, they all are doing great. Uh, but particularly in Tehuacan, uh, we've seen an influx of people, Amena, uh, and some of the highlights I want to tell you about is uh, a couple of weeks ago, or uh, maybe about a month ago, we had uh, one of the sisters uh, uh, call early in the morning, Sunday morning, and told me, you know what, my, my um, uh, brother was in an accident, he was in a rollover accident, and he was in the hospital uh, in a coma. Uh, so uh, she asked me to lift him up in prayer and as we were praying for him uh, uh, she called and he came out of the coma just as we were praying for him at the right moment so he's been coming out to church and it's amazing he was a backslider uh, and we're believing God for great things another uh, thing that happened also is that we have a family next door right next door to the church Uh, uh, we've invited them many times uh, but they were a hardcore Catholics, uh, Catholics, uh, and they were always giving us a hard time, bad attitudes. Uh, uh, somehow, you know, always trying to to pick a fight with us for the the parking space, etc. And uh, finally, uh, you know, uh, picking a fight with us all the time. Uh, we managed somehow, by the grace of God, to keep a cool most of the time. And and uh, and finally. 
uh, uh, the girl that lives there uh, came out to church uh, two Sundays ago, gave her life to Jesus, brought the kids. Uh, uh, they love Sunday school. They love everything about the church, uh, and they're, they're happy to come to church uh, uh, finally after all these years. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, we're seeing a regular influx of people, visitors coming, uh, getting saved every service, every single service, and it's a miracle because um, it hasn't been too long ago that not even the cucarachas would come to church. Uh, God is faithful. I, mean, I just kept thinking, you know, the Bible says, he that is faithful in little shall be faithful in much. Uh, Pastor Eric Killis asked me, have you broken a hundred? I wish I could tell you that. We only break a hundred when Pastor Stevens comes to preach for us. Uh, but if I can get my three congregations to come at the same time, I could probably break a hundred. Uh, a while back, a pastor told me, well, I want to thank God. I want to thank you, the pastor congregation. I, th I want to thank Pastor Stevens and Renee. And I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing without you. God bless you. My name is Ernesto and my wife Adriana. My name is Ernesto and my wife's name is Adriana. My hijas Nash, Daphne, Joy. My hijas Nash, uh, cada, cada año que llegábamos a la conferencia uh, llegábamos por Ciudad Juárez yo siempre decía pobres de los pastores que están en Juárez se voy a estar orando por ellos y yo nunca estaría en Juárez el próximo mes cumplimos dos años pastoreando en Ciudad Juárez. Uh, uh, next month we're going to be there two years. Tomamos una maravillosa iglesia ahí en la Santiago Troncoso, se llama la avenida. Uh, we took a, a church over. Uh, um, Santiago Troncoso. Uh, in a, a neighborhood called Santiago Troncoso. Y han sido uh, dos años maravillosos con esa iglesia. And we've been there two years with a uh, wonderful church. Este año uh, familias se han agregado a la iglesia. This year families have uh, added on to the church. Pero especialmente ha habido una respuesta en el área financiera de toda la congregación. But especially there has been a, a, a financial increase uh, uh, in all uh, the congregation. En diciembre tuvimos al pastor Ernie López. In December Pastor Ernie López uh, came. Se edificó la iglesia en el área de la profecía. And in the area of prophecy the church grew. grew. En el mes de febrero tuvimos al pastor evangelista Jerry Sarabia. And in February we had a pastor evangelist Jerry Sarabia. Tuvimos nuestro evento de matrimonios con 15 parejas. Uh, we had a marriage seminar with 15 couples. Y uh, el servicio en la noche fue uno de los servicios con la mayor asistencia que hemos tenido. And uh, one of the services at night was the best service that we ever, ever had. En ese servicio, en, durante el llamado al altar, llegó una familia. Uh, in that service, uh, uh, during the uh, altar call, we had a family Se salvaron, that came and got saved. Recibieron una profecía, they received a y prophecy. Hasta el día de hoy siguen asistiendo a la iglesia. And they're serving God to this day. Quiero dar gracias a Dios por la oportunidad de servirle. I want to thank God for the opportunity to serve him. Gracias a Pastor Stevens, a todo el staff de la Iglesia del Paso. I want to give thanks to Pastor Stevens and all the staff here in El Paso. A la Iglesia en la Santiago Troncoso, también muchas gracias. And also to the church over there in Santiago Troncoso. Pero también quiero agradecer a toda la Iglesia del Paso. But especially I want to thank the church in El Paso. Por darnos la oportunidad de ser un impacto a todo el mundo. Uh, for giving us uh, the opportunity to be to make an impact to the whole world. Sigan orando por nosotros, que Dios los bendiga. Keep praying for us. God bless you. Praise God. My name is Roger Dirk, along with my wife Annie, my sons Caleb and Carter. Uh, we are we're launched into Omaha, Nebraska. Ended up in Bellevue, which is a suburb there. Uh, I want to take just a moment here and really thank the El Paso uh, body congregation, uh, the effort and the labor, the love that you put into Springfield, Oregon. Uh, this is a church that I'm out of. Uh, we're there in Nebraska today because of you. And so all that's happening there is from your labor, your love, and your giving. And so I want to appreciate you, my pastor as well, Pastor 
Pastor Wilder and Melanie and all the Springfield Church. And so, uh, one more. Uh, Pastor Tim Haynes and Misa Haynes have been such a blessing to us there. And so, I really want to publicly just thank them. Um, and, and they've been such a blessing. So, uh, last year, just some highlights. After conference, we had an Easter event and went back, really encouraged to reach the um, Offutt Air Force Base. Um, and so, that was the plan. We have an Easter event. Let's reach the Air Force Base. And we went out there and, and nobody from the Air Force Base showed up. You know, it was Hispanics. All the Hispanics showed up. And so I, I'm not sure what it is about me because I, I'm the last person that I think would reach these people. Um, but they showed up. And, and it was really encouraging because we had had, right after that planned, a Cinco de Mayo, uh, Cinco de Mayo event there in South Omaha. Thousands of people come out. I mean, it's shoulder to shoulder for blocks and blocks. And so I was kind of encouraged after seeing you know, so many Hispanics come out. We're going to go there and reach people. Um, and we witnessed. Uh, Evangelist Craig McLaughlin came. He was, he was going to do a revival for us directly after. He was uh, praying with people. We were reaching people. Pastor Haynes was there, his church. Um, and there was a family that came out to that revival from that uh, Hispanic family again. Um, and they, not only did they get, get saved there, they, you know, they prayed, answered the altar call, but they've been locked into the church ever since um, and excited to do something for Jesus. In, in the summertime, we went out because it gets really hot and humid in Omaha, which is strange. I wouldn't have thought that, but it does. It's very hot. So they have splash pad parks everywhere. You can go out and there are people. So we went into South Omaha. We brought our, you know, our bullhorn and, and some hot dogs. And when you bring food out, everybody's excited. Um, and so we stood out there and that brother that got saved, um, in these, the revival, he came out and he, he doesn't speak great English, but you know, he gives it his best shot and he's, but he speaks Spanish. And so we took the opportunity for him to stand up there and to give a report or, you know, his, his testimony and people responded to that. I'm running out of time quickly. I do want to say this, uh, pastor Wilder came with the Springfield church, did a revival for us in, in August. Um, and the, the, the band played, uh, there were people that prayed on the doorsteps in the services. There was people that were filled with the Holy Spirit. One man got prayed uh, for. He had cancer. And so a pastor said, look, if you get healed, I want you to come back and give a report. Three months later, that man walks back in. He was healed of cancer. He wanted to give that report. Um, and so God is moving in Bellevue. Continue to pray for us. And we just want to thank you for all your prayers. God bless you. Amen. What a privilege we have to be a part of what we're a part of. Every time I come to a conference and hear the reports, my, I'm always just blown away that we get to be a part of this. We, we're hearing reports from all around the world that have to do with impact that we ourselves have made from small towns and little places. And I want to uh, receive the offering uh, this evening on this Tuesday night. You know, Tuesday night conference offering is a very interesting offering because it doesn't quite have the excitement of a Monday night offering. When everyone comes in fresh and we come in with our uh, offerings from our churches, we're excited about conference starting and then it doesn't have the excitement that a Thursday night offering has when you're launching international churches or a Friday night offering when you're launching churches and the excitement of all that God is doing. And it even pales in comparison to a Wednesday night offering because Wednesday, at least you're in the habit of giving on a Wednesday night. And here we are on Tuesday night. If offerings had feelings, <laughs> Tuesday night offering would feel rejected it would feel let down, like what is my purpose in life? But we're going to remove the rejection from the Tuesday night offering tonight because I want to declare to you how important the Tuesday night offering actually is because it's something that I don't think we consider. We are all fully aware of the incredible expenses that a conference center has to put out ahead of time uh, to cover a conference like this so that people like you and I can come and be fed, can be healed, can be restored. All kinds of bills from missionary airfares to hotels. I think Pastor Stephen said this year we know inflation, uh, everything's gone up. The, the expenses of this conference are up 30% from last year's conference. And that's not just growth, that's inflation. There's so many different things uh, that factor into that. And, and we all know that. We're all fully aware of the business side of a conference, which is what these offerings are meant to do is to take care of the expenses that the hosting mother church uh, has a need. And we are God's plan 
to cover that need. But I don't want to appeal to you from the perspective of a financial need because that's just boring business stuff that we're all familiar with. We are already aware that there is a great need before us with this conference and presented to us in this offering. But the greatest need that we have in our personal lives and for this conference is for a supernatural dimension to be upon our services, upon our lives, and upon this conference. We desperately need God to heal us. There are people here, you've come, and you are on your last leg coming in here. You limped into this conference. You need God to heal you. You need God to touch you. There's people that are so discouraged from the ministry, things that are happening. You need God to encourage you. There's others. You need to be rebuked. <laughs> you need to be exhorted. There's all kinds of needs that we have, and there's only one that can touch our needs, and that is God alone. We need God to visit with us. We need God to be here with us, but everything about our conferences and everything that God does in us leads up to what we begin to do on Thursday and Friday night of conference, where we begin to launch churches into the world and into the United States. We're climaxing at that point. Even us, as we're being healed throughout the week, God's touching us and God's moving us. God's directing us towards this ultimate goal of world evangelism, which is the heartbeat of God. But we're not just trying to hang uh, more flags in the building. We're not just throwing darts at a map and trying to add more dots on a map to flex our church planting muscles. No, we want to hear from God. We want God to tell us, what do you want me to do and where do you want me to go? We want God and the Holy Spirit to say to us, as he did in Acts 13, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work that I have called them to. That is our greatest need. God, who do you want to send and where do you want them to go? We want God to put his finger on the hearts of couples uh, and we want God to speak to Pastor Stevens, uh, giving him direction for all that we do on Thursday and Friday night. But this scripture in Acts chapter 13 that we all love so much, that we all desire for our hearts, uh, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work that I have called them to, has a very interesting backstory. And I think it's one that doesn't get seen very often because in the context of the book of Acts, which is a narrative historical uh, or a historical narrative of, of the early church and what God was doing, it's kind of weaving stories together. And what happens is, as we know, Stephen was martyred back in Acts chapter 7. Because he was martyred, uh, uh, the church began to be persecuted. They scattered all over the place, and many of the disciples went everywhere. One of the places they went to was Antioch. Antioch is in northern Syria. This is a, a quite a far way from Jerusalem, but what's fascinating about Antioch uh, is that they were Jews that went up, and there were Gentiles that went up that were all touched in Jerusalem, and they each started witnessing, and this incredible convergence of Jews and Gentiles started happening. Uh, conversions started happening, and this church started being built from, from just people witnessing as they were uh, uh, spread out and, and, and uh, scattered abroad because of the persecution. The church in Jerusalem, the mother church, hears about what's happening and they send Barnabas. Barnabas goes, uh, he arrives in Antioch, he's so encouraged by what's happening, uh, but he also understands there's some complicated dynamics happening here with the Jews and the Gentiles, and Barnabas realizes, I need some help. So he goes to Tarshish, uh, he gets Saul, and he brings Saul back to Antioch, and they start ministering in Antioch together for a period of about a year. In that time, some prophets come through Antioch from Jerusalem, and one of them stands up and declares there's going to be a famine that is going to impact the entire Roman world. Now, most people would look at that, hear that, and they would shake their head and say, what a shame, what a pity. How do we prepare ourselves for the end times? What do we need to do? But the disciples at Antioch were different. The disciples at Antioch in Acts chapter 11, verse 29, the Bible says the disciples, they heard this, 
There's going to be a desperate need in our mother church in Jerusalem. This famine is going to impact them. And he says, the disciples, as each one was able, decided to provide help for the brothers and sisters living in Judea. And they did this, sending their gifts by the elders, uh, by Barnabas and Saul. You know what's interesting about this? When they prophesied, he didn't say there's going to be a great famine in the land and God wants you to respond to the need. He just said there's going to be a great famine in the land, but these disciples were so moved by the fact that their mother church would have a desperate need that they in, their, in and of themselves with their own initiative said, we're going to do something about this. And they took up an offering and they did whatever each person was able to do. They gathered it together and they sent it with Barnabas and Saul to Jerusalem. And this is where it gets a little bit tricky in the narrative of Acts because you almost think that that is over because the, the very next chapter in chapter 12 is, uh, starts talking about Peter being in prison. Herod found him. James uh, uh, was killed by Herod. He likes what the, how the people responded. And so he gets Peter. He locks him in prison and he's going to execute him. Uh, the night before he executes him, an angel comes, busts him out of prison. Uh, he's free. And then it talk, starts talking about how uh, Herod ends up uh, being eaten by worms and it's this incredible stuff that's happening and then at the end of that chapter there's a very interesting verse uh, it says and it picks up where it left off in chapter 11 almost an entire chapter later where if you're not careful you don't make the connection the Bible says in chapter 12 verse 25 when Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission what was their mission their mission was to go to Jerusalem and deliver relief to the church there because of the famine that was coming when Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission. It's like the Holy Spirit starts talking about this need, this famine, this offering, pauses, tells this story about what's happening to Peter, and then he presses play at the end of chapter 12, and we roll right into chapter 13, which is now in the church at Antioch. There were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, uh, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Mannion, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them to. Everything that happened in the launching of Paul and Barnabas into the ministry, into the mission field, began with a need presented to the church about the mother church. It wasn't about their own church. It was about their mother church. And they rose up and they said, we're going to respond not to our own needs. We're going to look out for our mother church. See, sending missionaries was not their idea. It was God's idea. They didn't have this in their mind. Hey, we're going to take this offering and then we're going to become missionaries. In their mind, we're just going to meet a need. But the Holy Spirit saw their response uh, that seemed physical. It just seemed uh, like an ordinary thing. You're going to help your brothers out. But they carried it. They went there. They went on a journey. They gave it to Jerusalem. They come back uh, and something was triggered in the spiritual realm when they gave that physical offering. Because money is spiritual. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit looks at this church, looks at these two people, and he says, this is a trustworthy church, and these are trustworthy men, and I'm going to raise them up and give them the privilege of partnering with me in world evangelism. And he raises up this little church in Antioch. It's a baby church, and it's in Antioch, and yet God says, that's the church that I'm going to start all my missionary endeavors from. I'm going to go into all the world from this church right here because they were faithful to respond to a need in their mother church. And what I am telling you tonight is that what we do tonight in covering expenses, in paying bills, is not about business. It's about setting a platform for the Holy Spirit to say to us, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work I've called them to. That's what this is about. That's why Tuesday night offering is so important. And as the ushers come, I want to say one more thing. It's not a coincidence that the very people who carried the offering to Jerusalem are the same two men that God called and said, set apart for me 
Barnabas and Saul for the work I've called them to. You want a supernatural world evangelism dynamic in your church? It's not about you taking care of all your own business. It's about you seeing a need that we have tonight, looking at $200,000 of expenses and saying, you know what, I may not be able to cover all 200, but there's something I can do. And, and asking myself the question, am I doing everything I'm able to do? Am I going to be able to release a spiritual dimension? I will tell you from the perspective of a conference center, there is something that happens in the heart of a pastor who is sending when the bills have been paid and the expenses have been covered. It's like a release in you, like, man, where are we going to send churches? Who's available? What can we do? These people are ready to support it. Let's do this. It's the same thing that happened with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit said, I found a faithful church. I found two faithful men that are concerned about their mother church. I'm going to bless them, and I'm going to start all this in their church, in their house. That is the dimension that we can release tonight. What we're talking about tonight is setting a platform for what God wants to do and what God wants to say to us, not just this week, but Thursday night, Friday night, giving us direction to change the world. Let's bow our heads uh, this evening. I want to encourage you to give. There is uh, a number of ways to give. If you're looking on the screen, uh, uh, you can see online giving. If you're participating uh, from home, I'm asking you, don't just watch tonight's service uh, and take from it. Uh, I want to encourage you to participate, uh, and I want you to give. I want you to participate in this service uh, and what God is doing, uh, whether you're giving here in person or online, uh, you can select Conference Tuesday and you can give tonight. May the Lord bless you as you give. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful for the privilege that you have given us to minister here in this conference to be a part of what you're doing in the world. We are asking you for a supernatural dimension to be released upon our services. Every service, Lord, as we move forward and lead up to that which you want to do, those you want to set apart and send. We want to partner with you, God. We want to set the platform uh, for what you want to do later on in the week. Uh, we give you praise. We honor you. We bless you. I'm asking you to bless the gift and the giver tonight. Uh, in Jesus' name, amen. And revive us, O oh Lord, to revive us. Revive us, O oh Lord, won't you revive us? Fill us with your love and in your mind, revive us, oh Lord, won't you be, I've got my heart, now I've got my heart set on Jesus, I've got my mind set on the Lord, I've got my shoulder to the plow, and I won't turn back no way, no how, I've got my Revive us, O oh Lord. Revive us, O oh Lord. Won't you revive us? Revive us, O oh Lord. Won't you revive us? Fill us with your love and power. Strengthen us in your mind. Revive us, O oh Lord. I've got my heart. think that the Tuesday night, Tuesday night offering feels all warm and fuzzy tonight. And the Tuesday night offering is very grateful for that incredible history lesson and the inspiration to give and be generous and liberal. God uh, spoke to me today to give Pastor Joe Campbell a word. I don't really have a forum uh, to do that other than right now. So as a way of introducing him, I want to speak a word from God uh, to Pastor Joe Campbell. He's a very special, uh, unique gift to our fellowship. In September of last year, he and I were invited to preach at the conference in Sydney, Australia, 
and he arrived on a Tuesday, I arrived on Wednesday, and on Tuesday, while Pastor Joe Campbell was standing at baggage when he arrived in Sydney, Australia, he suffered a cardiac arrest. A cardiac arrest is not the same as a heart attack. When you have a heart attack, your heart is still functioning to some degree, although uh, it's stressed and strained and you can faint, you can feel pain. A cardiac arrest, your heart stops and essentially you're dead unless somebody can be there to revive you. And so Pastor Campbell collapses. Standing next to him is a heart specialist doctor who within a few seconds recognized what happened and was able to revive him. So Pastor Campbell was a goner and then he was a comer. He spent some days in the hospital. Pastor Rob Walsh and I were able to visit him on the Saturday uh, after conference. And I want to say to Pastor Campbell that God was showing you something through that. God was doing something to get your attention about what lies ahead. And Pastor Campbell began to say after he recovered, he told me on the phone, he mentioned it in a number of different settings. He said, God, if you've saved me for something, I don't want to miss it. That's what Pastor Joe Campbell was saying. But God is saying, Pastor Campbell, God is saying, I have saved you for something and you're not going to miss it. Your desire, Pastor Campbell, is to function at a greater dimension of ministry from now on in order to help people, in order to serve the church, and in, in order to advance the cause of Christ around the world. And your ministry, Pastor Campbell, has always been a help and incredibly fruitful. And your preaching and your fellowship and conversation, uh, there's a dimension of God that's always flowed from your life, but God is going to take you beyond where you have ever been before this point. I thought of two scriptures, 1 Corinthians 2 9, but as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. That's a word for you, Pastor Campbell, for right now. You want to function at a greater dimension, be a greater help as you're entering into your 80s and you know you don't have much uh, time here on earth. None of us do. Jesus is coming. Uh, but as you're pondering where you're headed, uh, you're thinking about functioning at another level, uh, but it hasn't even entered into your thinking the things that God has prepared for you. Another scripture is Ephesians 3.20. Now to him, the Lord, Jesus, who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Now to him who is able to do all that we ask or think, that would be a very good statement, a very complete statement. That means we think something, God responds and does it. But that's not what this scripture says. This scripture says, Pastor Campbell, that God moves outside the boundaries of what you think and he does exceedingly and abundantly above all that you can ask or think. So while you have thought about and imagined where you want to go from here, you have not been able to conceive where God is going to take you. God is going to give you five dimensions going forward. First of all, a, a supernatural gift ministry that is going to be operating at a level, you, a level you haven't yet experienced. And when it begins to function, when you begin to feel the stirring and the burning in your heart, you may feel a little uncomfortable, but I'm saying to you, do not hold back. Because the latter part of your ministry is going to bear much greater fruit than the former. I think you've been preaching now for about 45 years, maybe longer. You're on the final lap as we all are. You can expect much greater impact. The years ahead of you are going to far exceed the years that are behind you. And four other things that are specific uh, that I want you to receive. First of all, God is going to give you special gifting, uh, and you've always done this, but it's going to be at another level, uh, a, a help for missionaries. 
Missionaries need a word from God. Missionaries get hammered by Satan. There are struggles that pastors' wives endure and children endure uh, when they're out in the vast uh, uh, expanse uh, of the world. You're going to be able to provide clarity for these missionaries uh, that is going to help them and enable them to continue. You're going to be, secondly, or thirdly, rather, you're going to see ministry salvaged by a word that you speak. Preachers and pastors and missionaries, maybe evangelists, uh, are going to want to quit. They've made up their minds to give up uh, and go back for redirection. Redirection is honorable and it's necessary sometimes, uh, but you're going to be able to speak a word uh, that is going to salvage ministry, keep it in place, uh, and cause that ministry to function stronger than it ever has. Your wisdom has always been a great asset. God is going to give you wisdom that is going to be dispersed uh, and among leaders. God is going to specifically lay on your heart uh, at different times uh, various pastors and leaders, uh, and you are to call them and speak a word to them. God is going to do this in a very powerful way that's going to leave no doubt. Uh, and until you make that call or in, speak to them at a conference, uh, God is not going to let you rest until you disperse uh, the godly wisdom that God has given you. And finally, uh, God is going to give you men and money, a, an abundance of both uh, and a surplus uh, to accomplish greater. What you've accomplished in the first 45 years, uh, God is going to exceed that uh, in the latter years of your ministry, saith the Lord. Amen. So with that, let's welcome Pastor Joe Campbell. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go sit down. <laughs> it, uh, I do want to thank everyone. A uh, number of people uh, have come to me, said, Pastor, we pray for you and your wife, Connie, I want to thank you personally. Uh, Connie and I, I talk, we were talking recently, and we're probably both still living because you're praying. And uh, so thank you. You know, I hesitate even to say this, but uh, um, the pastor just spoke about men and money. Last night after I took the offering, I went uh, to my room and... Uh, I got a text from one of our churches. Our conference is coming into September. And he told me, he said, uh, Pastor, and he named this man, says, uh, this man just spoke to me and uh, said he's going to give uh, $125,000 for conference. Half of it for world evangelism, half of it for the expense of the conference. And all the years I've pastored, I've had numbers of times where someone maybe gave 30000 for it. But that's the first time I can ever remember one individual uh, saying, and this man has given before, you know, maybe 30000 or twenty, but 125000 And then pastor just gets up and says... God's going to give you men and money. Now I want the men. Amen. Praise the Lord. But would you give God praise? First Samuel chapter 16. Uh, the truth is our God is a calling God. He saves that's powerful. But once we're saved, he calls people for his purposes. God has designs on your life. He wants to <coughs> enlist you into kingdom business. This is how the kingdom of God functions. This is how the kingdom of God advances. This is how... Nations are won and cities and demonic is cast out. Much of the Bible <clears throat> is God's story 
about how he calls people, ordinary people, people like you and I. He calls us to do his bidding. Everyone here, you're saved. He has a part for you to play, a role for you to fulfill. Maybe here in your church, your local church. It could be out on the mission field, the church field of church planting. And many times there's a bit of a mystery element involved in this. But he is a God who calls. My question tonight is, can he call you? Jesus said, many are called, but few are chosen. Can you be called and chosen? For the harvest is great and the laborers are few. I want to minister tonight and ask you a question. Can God call you? 1 Samuel 16, uh, very interesting, beginning with uh, verse number one. It's about Samuel and the calling of David. Now the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I'm sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I provided myself a king among his sons. Then invite Jesse to the sacrifice. Samuel said, pardon me, verse two, how can I go if Saul hears it, he will kill me. The Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Then invite Jesse to the sacrifice. I will show you what you shall do. You shall anoint for me the one I named to you. So Samuel did what the Lord said. Went to Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, do you come peaceably? He said, peaceably I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves. Come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them. So it was when they came that he looked at Eliab and he said, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. The Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance, his physical statue, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as a man sees, for man looks on the outward appearance, the Lord looks at the heart. Jesse called Abinadad and made him pass before Samuel. He said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made Shaman a pass and he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said again, are all the young men here? He said, there remains yet the youngest. There he is keeping the sheep. Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. He sent and brought him in. He was ruddy with bright eyes, good looking, and the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is the one. Samuel took the horn of oil, anointed David in the midst of his brothers. The spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. Father, we come by the blood. We come by the power of the Holy Ghost tonight. We come by the revelation of your word. God, I'm asking you to call men and women couples, God, tonight. I'm asking you to stir the hearts of young men for kingdom business. I'm asking you, God, to break through all of the resistance that we have the ability to throw between us and you. God, give us nations as an inheritance. Bless these churches, these people. God, I'm asking you tonight, bind up the brokenhearted. Set at liberty those that are bruised. Open prison doors, God, those who find themselves incarcerated. God, open doors that they may excel for kingdom business. Heal the sick. God, God, help us to take your gospel 
to the multitude of the poor in Jesus' name, amen. I want you to think with me tonight when God calls. In our text, God appears to Samuel. He doesn't warn him. There's no prerequisition. God shows up. I'm sending you to. Samuel, there's somewhere I want you to go. I have a place. Many times the beginning of God's call is a place. Not just anywhere. It's specific. And it's not always the place we would choose. It's not the place we've planned. It's not the place that perhaps we've fantasized about. I want you to go to Bethlehem. Right here, many miss God's call. It's a small place. It's not even mentioned in the cities of Judah. Micah 5, 2, you Bethlehem, though thou art like among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, who's going forth are from old, from everlasting to everlasting. How many times do we miss God's call because it's camouflaged in insignificance? Samuel could have said Bethlehem. It's not attractive, it's too small. I wonder how many here In the eyes of the world, it's too unimportant. It's not impressive. There can be no opportunity in that city or that place. How many times I'm not interested. We see no advantage there. I'm going to pass on this one. I remember a number of years ago, Pastor Mitchell was in the tent, and I could tell been with him quite a lot. I could tell he was disturbed. It was a conference. So I come up to the platform. He's standing in front of the platform. And I said, you you okay? He said, Joe, he said, we're finished. I said, what do you mean finished? He said, there's a spirit and an attitude. He said, he spoke about a city in the desert. He said, I've offered this church to two or three pastors And he said, you won't believe what? One of them said, do they have a dental program? Another one said, I I can't can't pastor in the desert. It's too hot. Another one said, well, my children, uh, they're in school. And I could feel his agony. And what they were saying is this is too insignificant. I pass. I'm not interested first church I ever pastored, I was a youth pastor for a while, but first church I ever pastored, it. this was in the Assemblies of God, was Mounds, Illinois. They hadn't had a pastor for seven months. There was about 20 people there. The former pastor was a woman. I looked at the population of 2020 of Mounds, Illinois. It was 661 people. When I went there, there was about 1,800. The poorest county in the state of Illinois. We moved into the Sunday school rooms, me and my wife and two kids. $75 a week. Can you imagine? Our living room was the fellowship hall. Our kids' bedrooms was the Sunday school rooms. The church bathroom was our bathroom. I'm not advising you to do that. I'm just saying, we were so excited. And you know, there were pastors that said, don't do it, don't do it. It's a dead end. Don't, no, 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 no. But it was in Mounds, Illinois, where I connected with Pastor Mitchell. It was Mounds, Illinois, where, and, and the church grew. A lot of good things happened. I took two van loads of Assembly of God people to Prescott Conference, and Pastor Launch Connie and I and our kids to Phoenix, Arizona. Can you connect the dots? 
What if Samuel had refused? Better question, what if you refuse? Would there have been a David? And then something interesting. God said, Samuel, fill your horn with oil. I want you to go to a place, but now you have to choose to fill your horn. Your horn speaks of your life. It represents and symbolizes you. You cannot minister what you do not have. What are you full of? Are you so full of yourself there's no room for God? I want you to fill your horn. The oil, of course, represents the spirit of God, the anointing, the unction, the power of God. I want you, you're going to deposit this on another man. I want to I remove that anointing from Saul and you're gonna be an instrument to transfer it to David. You know the story, he pours the oil on David symbol again of authority set apart for God holiness calling for purpose when he pours this in Samuel took the horn of oil anointed it and the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward this divine enabling this supernatural presence of God I think I said this morning, I depend on God's presence and power. Otherwise, it's just words and theology and information. Are you full of the Spirit of God? Later in Psalms 18, 2, David declares, the Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my shield. The horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Prophecy. Zacharias. Blessed is the Lord God of Israel for he has visited and redeemed his people and he has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. That we should be saved from our enemies. So the child grew and became strong in the spirit. What about you? Is your horn your life? Are you filling what we call ministry? with the spirit, the anointing of God. The anointing that breaks the yoke. The anointing that Jesus said, the words I speak are spirit and life. In other words, he said, I'm not just dispersing Bible information. When I speak, there's a spirit, the Holy Spirit, the spirit of the living God being transferred into another person's life. Are you trying to minister with an empty horn and you wonder why it's not working? What are you full of? What are you filling your life with? That's an honest question. Acts 1.8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You'll be witnesses to me. 2.4, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. You know the verses. Acts 17.6, these that have turned the world upside down have come here. Don't fill your life with things that mean nothing to God and nothing to eternity. I pastor good people that are so full 
of nonsense when you think about eternity and you think about kingdom business there's little left for the oil Samuel you fill your horn and go I'm sending you God sends us but we choose to fill our horn you decide what am I going to fill my mind with? My time. What am I going to give my energy to? Are you wasting your life on foolishness? Are you filled with God's word? Are you filled with obedience? God, here am I. Are you filled with the spirit? Are you filled with compassion? Are you crying out for gifting? God, I want you to give me a double portion. LeBron James read recently he was giving advice to young NBA players. He said the cars and the jewelry and all that dumb stuff that don't matter means absolutely nothing. I see a lot of these kids getting so unfocused about stuff that is so material, they lose their focus for the game. To be a pro, you show up for work. You be ready to work. If you're on time, you're late. Put the work in. Be the first one in the gym, the last one to leave. Pour it all into the game if you want to be great. Learn the history of the game. Respect those that came before you. Worry about the game. Worry about your family. You take care of the game, and the game will take care of you. If that's true about basketball, how much more about ministry? Are you the first one in the prayer room? Are you the last to leave? What about calling, pastoring, being a missionary? Samuel, I'm sending you. Can God send you? Can God send you? I preached a sermon kind of along this stream, and I've got a couple of doctors, number of nurses in our church, and uh, they're on call at times. They're on call. And uh, I was stirred about this, and uh, especially you think about uh, your pastor talked. I collapsed. I'm talking to Connie on the phone, and I, I said, I'm getting a little dizzy. And a boom, I went down. Some guy was there. He grabbed my phone. He said, who is this? I said, I'm his wife. He said, he's not breathing. And then this doctor jumped on me, broke my sternum, broke my ribs, <clears throat> but I'm alive. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I tried to find out who this man was. I, I wasn't able to, but think, he had places to go. Evidently, he was on the plane with me. I mean, he had his, his, no doubt he's waiting on his baggage. He had perhaps appointments. He had business. Maybe he's meeting family. Maybe he's on vacation. I don't know. But all of that disappeared, and what took precedence was my life. These doctors in the church, they said, you know, Pastor, when we're on call, it doesn't matter if we're eating with our family. Doesn't matter if I'm at my son's little league ball game. Doesn't matter if I'm right in the middle of some project. This takes precedence. Precedence over every activity to save a, a life. How much more? And they said sometimes it means life or death. If that's true in the natural, how much more in the spiritual? Are you on call for God? That interrupts, I mean, God. 
What if that doctor is somebody else? Would I be here? Then these powerful words, so Samuel did what the Lord said. Too many, I fear, waste years in the valley between God sending and us going. We waste days, months, perhaps years in this chasm between God's call and our going. I've pastored in Chandler a long time. I've listened to guys a long time. They talk about going, they dream about going, they glamorize going, they think about it, but they never do it. I've seen men who talk so long about going, in their mind, it became the same as going. Somewhere you gotta pull the trigger, brother, amen. The Bible said, so Samuel, he did what the Lord said. He actually did it. God sins, but we have to choose to go. Are you doing it? God's speaking to people this week. Last night, powerful message. God's speaking and going to speak this week, but does it mean anything to you? He did it. I wonder how many are like Jonah. They know what God said. The question is not confusion. It's not the lack of clarity. Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. It wasn't vague. He wasn't debating, asking. The bottom line is obedience. Obedience is better than sacrifice. God said, I want you to go to Nineveh. Jonah said, Tarshish. What's your Tarshish? Comfort? Security? Family? Friends? Culture? Lifestyle? I talk about going full-time in the ministry by faith on $25 a week with a wife and two kids. Lived in the church attic. And people just... I got guys in my church and, you know, they're 32 and haven't bought a home and they think they've, they've failed. Give me a break. <clears throat> Pastor Mitchell told me one time, you don't even need to start thinking about retirement money until you're 55 or 60. I love him. I miss him. We're old school. Amen. Stop that. Stop that. Quit being silly. Amen. <laughs> I'll send you my slapping video. No, I'm very silly. <laughs> Too many like Jonah. The world is changed and won by those who will go. Think about Jesus. He's 12 years old. He went missing. They've gone to Jerusalem. And the family, no doubt there's quite a number, caravan. <clears throat> They're returning back home, Bethlehem. Three days later, they realize Jesus is missing. So they have to turn around and go back to Jerusalem and when his mother Mary finds him, she scolds him. Why have you done this? Luke 2.48, to us. Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. Some were worried about you. You've cost us time. You've interrupted our plans. A lot of trouble here. You've inconvenienced the family. We had to turn around and return for you. She's scolding him. Jesus responds, do you not know? In other words, the thought, you should have known. I must be about my father's business. 12 
years old. And the Bible says in Luke 2.50, they did not understand. Listen, there are people who love you when you live totally for kingdom business, the Father's business, they will not understand you. And they've had their own experience with God. Mary and Joseph had some incredible encounters with God. But now he said, you don't, you're not getting it, Mom. Church people don't always get it. I just found this out at the Pioneer Rally. Uh, <clears throat> Jesse Morales on staff in Prescott. And uh, he said, Pastor Campbell, he's talking to Tori actually, said, I was like 11 years old at a men's rally and you're preaching. He said, I'm just goofing around. I'm 11 years old, raised in church. I'm just kind of goofing around, you know, just horsing around. And he said, you call people to preach. He said, I'm 11 years old. He says, Phew. He said, I had a God moment and I made up my mind. That's what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm going to be a preacher. 11 years old. God caught him. Today, credible young man of God, many of you know, on staff in Prescott. Can God catch you tonight? Maybe you're not even, con he was a boy, not even considerate. <clears throat> Here's Jesus. He's radical. Are you radical? I have parents sometimes. They're, I mean, they're saved in church. Their kids get on fire. And they're worried about their soccer game. People want to go, you know, I, I'm, Mary and Joseph aren't even people. We're glad you're saved, but Africa with my grandbabies? Peru? Hey, slow down here. Hey, wait, 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 wait. You're too young. The Bible said Jesus increased in wisdom and statue in favor with God and men. Are you about your father's business? He said, Mom, Dad, listen, this is my life. I must be about my father's business. This is my priority. This is my duty. This is my calling. This is what I live for. One place he said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. My nourishment, my satisfaction, my fulfillment, my joy, my life, my purpose is my father's business. Listen, that shakes the world. Jesus said in one place, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. No place to rest. Not about comfort. And what he's saying is, I must be about my father's. But he was laboring. You read three and a half years of ministry. He's, he's meeting needs. He's, he's feeding multitudes. He's healing lepers. He's casting out demons. He's teaching. He's spending time with the disciples. You read three years, basically, of ministry, and it reads like three decades or three centuries. When you read all that was compacted into it, he's in a boat, he's exhausted. <clears throat> and the disciples are in the boat, and this storm comes up raging storm and he's sleeping you know the story 
the disciples finally go to him and they say, don't you care? They wake him up, we're perishing. He gets up, rebukes the storm. How could you sleep in a storm? I was in the Navy. I was in a typhoon one time. My opinion, they're afraid of being shipwrecked and capsized. He's sleeping. Why? He's so exhausted. He's exhausted. He's been ministering and giving himself in his father's business. He's not exhausted from pickleball. <clears throat> New craze, amen. My neighbor's got one. I didn't even know. I wonder. I was curious. He's not exhausted from hanging out at Starbucks. Not exhausted from making money. Been at the gym so much. He's exhausted from labor in his father's business. What's your ministry resume? It's a Bible conference. A lot of pastors, disciples, men that want to be pastors. Paul gives this his, 2 Corinthians 11, and I won't read it all. You can read it. Verse 23. Are they ministers of Christ? And then he begins to give his resume in labors more abundant, journeys often, perils, weariness, toil, Sleeplessness often, fastings often. Is that you? <clears throat> Is that you? See, it's not cheap when you say, God, I'm going to do what you call me to do. There's a risk factor. Samuel says, how can I do this? Saul, Saul, he's going to kill me. There will be people who will try to kill your calling. And it's not someone in Walmart that you don't know. Normally it's people you know. They'll try to kill it with discouragement. They'll try to kill it with bad advice. Or they'll mock you or criticize you. Are you about your father's business? Samuel, the Bible said, he did it. Effective ministry must see as God sees. Samuel was great at hearing from God. You can read his history. But like many, when it comes to seeing as God sees and choosing as God chooses, Think where he's at. <clears throat> he's at Jesse's house. The history, the future of Israel, kingdom of God, destiny is linked to Samuel choosing and laying his hands on. Jesse, bring out your sons. Now think of this. They see the horn full of oil. They know this is, this is a heavy moment. They're not ignorant concerning this. There's expectation, no doubt. These young men, I mean, the father, Jesse, I mean, there's a lot of spiritual atmosphere here. So it was when they came, he looked at Eliab and said, surely this is the Lord's anointed. He's before him. He looked but he did not see as God sees. What do you see when you look? Is he about to choose another Saul? Remember about Saul? No one like him among the people. He stood head and shoulders above all the people. Remember 1 Samuel 9, 2, a handsome son whose name was Saul. There was none more handsome person than among the children of Israel. His shoulders Upward, He was taller than any of the people. 
The effectiveness of future ministry is very much dependent upon who you're choosing today. Samuel is ready to pour the oil on the wrong person. It's one thing to hear from God. It's another thing to see as God sees. Wait, 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 stop Samuel right there. Whoa, 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 whoa. Listen to me, God's speaking to him. You're not seeing. You're looking at the wrong qualities. The Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance, his physical statue. I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as a man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. What do you look for? Is it all about talent? Personality? Appearance? They're smart? Entertaining? Witty? Do you see potential where no one else does? Part of ministry is seeing possibilities and potential in disciples and couples. They don't see it in themselves. Pastor Mitchell saw something in me I did not see in myself when he launched Connie and I. What do you see sitting in front of you, beside you, behind you? Maybe in your own home. Jesse doesn't see it in his own son. He's his father. I wonder how many parents keep their sons tied to a sheep career when God needs them in kingdom business. If Peter was in your church, would he still be fishing? <clears throat> I'm just asking. I mean, think about this. He denied the Lord to his face. Cursed. Never. What would you do right there, Pastor? <laughs> I hate to think what I would do. I mean, doesn't that blow your theology? I mean, he's, he's using bad language, and in a few weeks, he's going to stand, preach a little sermon you can read in three or four minutes, and 3,000 saved. If he was in your church and he denied you, I never knew you, you're, you're in a hard place. You're in a courtroom somewhere. They're, they're trying to arrest you for preaching on the street and he turns his back and walks away. <laughs> Not me. Would you launch him? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Ministry, you got to learn to laugh. I had a joke. I never asked Pastor Mitchell. He preached our conference every year. I never asked him about a man that he didn't say, launch him, camel. Oh, you know, Joe Camel. Launch him, camel. I launched you and didn't even know you. <clears throat> so we had a joke. We had a joke among the pastors in Chandler. I'd say, Pastor Mitchell, he's dealing drugs out the back door. He's got two or three ladies' friends. Launch him, camel. <laughs> I launched you, I didn't even know you. <clears throat> I'm joking, of course. But do you see, what do you see when you see people? Do you see possibilities? That's ministry. You have to communicate that. Do you look for the heart or the head? Can you imagine David? I mean, he's not ignorant. He's young, but he, I mean, he knows something's coming down. All the brothers are invited but me. How would you feel right there? I mean, I mean, can you put yourself there? And yet God says, Samuel, none of these. You got any more? Yeah, there's David. He's, he's out with the sheep. Bring him. 
When Samuel looks at him, God said, this is the one. This is the one. Do you see possibilities where other people only see problems? Do you see potential where all other people see as flaws and a history of bad decisions? Can your pastor call you? He calls David. A lot of young men, a lot of disciples. Can your pastor cast the mantle on you? And I'm closing. Think about Elijah and Elisha. Elisha's plowing with 12 yoke of oxen. He has it made. I mean, a massive, perhaps, corporate, that valley there was fertile. They have an enterprise. No doubt his parent, they're, they're preparing him maybe to even take over the family business. Elijah comes by. He's plow- I, I don't know, Elisha, it doesn't say that he was praying and God said, yeah, Elijah's coming by. He's out there working, 12 yoke of oxen. There's others, there's uh, employed people. All, and one powerful, he, well, and cast the mantle on him. The mantle of calling. Can your pastor cast a mantle on you? And he, on the spot, there was a few questions back and forth. And I just said, what have I to do with you? But he slaughtered the oxen, took the plow, probably a wooden plow, made an altar and a sacrifice to God and never looked back. Can God in this conference drop the mantle on you? Young man, can God, can your pastor say, look, look, I see the hand of God on you. You need to go for it. Quit messing around with all the world. You need to be about your father's business. He poured that horn on David. He's the greatest king Israel ever had. The lineage of Jesus Christ. Can God call you? I ask you to bow your head with me this evening. Before we do anything tonight, are you saved? Are you born again? Salvation is such an incredible miracle of God. I've been saved. I got saved in 1971. And I'm telling you, I don't have the words. I wish I had the words to communicate how powerful You can be born again. You can start all over. Think of that. You can can be born all over again. Get a whole new start. The Bible said old things will pass away. Everything will become new. Sins forgiven. Guilt erased. And then God begins to call you to his purpose. Blessing. Forgiveness. He can deliver you from drugs and insanity just like he did me. He's here tonight. He came, he died that you could be forgiven. Think of that. You're here tonight. Your life's a mess, a lot of pain. Maybe you've been raised in church but not saved. You're here tonight. You don't want to go to hell. Without being born again, you must be born again or you'll never see the kingdom of God. It's the difference between heaven and hell. You're here this evening. Spirit of God, grace of God has touched you in dealing with you. And you'd say, Pastor Campbell, tonight I want to pray. Would you let me pray for you tonight? You'd say, Pastor I need Jesus. I'm not saved. I'm not right with God. I want to get my heart right that you, you're here this evening 
Right now, you go on record before God. You just lift your hand and say, that's me. That's me. I need to be saved. I need a miracle. I need to be born again. Here's my hand, Pastor. Here's my hand. You'd lift your hand. You'd lift your hand. That's me. I'm not saved. I'm not right with God. I see your hand, dear. God bless you. Thank you. Who else? You'd lift your hand. You'd join her. That's me. That's me. That's me. You'd lift your hand right now. That's me. I'm not right. I see another hand in the back. God bless you. Thank you. Who else? You'd join these. Who else? You'd join these. You'd join these. Just lift your hand. I see your hand. God bless you. Thank you. Who else? That's me. That's me. Backslider. That's me. That's me, Pastor. I need to get some things right with God. Anyone else before I change the order of this service? You lifted your hand. Would you lift it up and hold it that I could see it? You lift it up and hold it. Your hand's lifted. Would you lift your eyes and look at me? Sincere with God. Back here, sincere with God. Over here, back here, sincere with God. I want all of you with your hands lifted. Would you come? Would you come? Someone's going to pray with you. Would you come? Over here, dear, would you come? Thank you for your honesty. Would you come? God's going to give you a miracle. He's going to give you a miracle. He's going to give you a miracle. Anyone else you want to join these before we change the order of the service? I want to give a simple call to your church. Can God call you? Can God call you for his purpose? I ask you to stand with me all over this building. I want to open these altars. You want to come and find a place to pray. Can God call you? And sometimes it's in the church. It's ministry in the church. I have a couple been over children's church for decades. Others, it's called to pioneer and pastor in the mission field, evangelist. God builds his kingdom, advances his kingdom through calling. Through calling. Let's pray, asking you to cry out to God. Oh, Ramasam, the spirit of the living God. Let God touch you. It's a game changer. Oh, God, you cable rebo sandaim. My Lord and my God, you cable remo shivo levo Ramasandayam. Oh, Ramasam, the lava rebo shika levo remo sayam. Oh God, you cable rebo shevo levo ramasandayam. Oh God, you cable remo sandayam. Here am I, God, send me, send me, send me. Here am I, O oh Lord, God, send me, send me, send me. Oh, Rama Sandai. Oh, Rama Sandala Lava Rebo Shikaya. God, the cable level Remo Shikaya. God, the cable level Remo Shikaya. Oh, Rama Sandala Lava Rebo Shikaya. God, God, send me, send me. Lord, send me, O God. Oh, God, Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul.
Let me say something to you, church. Let me say something to you. The greatest place of safety is in the will of God. 1987, one morning I'm in church. I felt, I thought someone was out in the sanctuary down on Washington Street. I come out in the sanctuary, God was there. I fell at the altar, began to weep. God said, I'm going to put you in Malaysia, son. I'm pastoring 300 people at the time. Had around 100 disciples. The whole church was young. We're having weddings, babies constantly. Call Pastor Mitchell. I spoke to Connie first, called Pastor Mitchell. And went to Malaysia. While we were in Malaysia, you've probably seen the memorial stones. 1990, the big split. No cell phones those days, no internet, I'm isolated. The men who were the major players in that split, one of them was the man that was preaching the night I was saved, brought me into the fellowship. I had preached for these, I was associated with these two wings, if I could use that term of the fellowship. If I'd been in the States, and Pastor Mitchell and I talked about this, would I have been sucked into that through relationship? I'm isolated in Malaysia. I said, I was far away, able to pray, and I said, this is insane. It's crazy, and I did not buy into it. What if I had said to God, I'm pastoring 300 people here, God. It's my dream. I mean, we're rocking and rolling. Greatest place of safety is in the will of God. Pastor Martinez, I mentioned him this morning. He's pastoring 200 people, international, few international works in India. I remember at conference in the parking lot, him running across the parking lot. And I mentioned some of his history this morning. He, he come out of the streets. I remember walking across our parking lot, just like your conference night, and he's running, screaming, Pastor Campbell, send me! Screaming. And I did. Today, he's had incredible, incredible impact on Glendale, Arizona, and his family. My wife, Connie, we're probably bumping 70. I'm a little bit older than her. I might have been 74, 75. She's five years younger than me. We're in Prescott Conference. We're not kids. I remember her leaning over to me, tears in her eyes. She said, honey, if God speaks to you, I'll go anywhere in the world with you. A powerful. Ladies, ladies, listen, that is, that's blood in the game. Will you, will you wives do that? I want to ask you to stand with me right where you are. I want you to take a couple of steps back, if you would, give some room if possible. And I want to give a call. You're here, you're a young man. You're not pastoring. Can your pastor cast the mantle on you?
going to go on record before God. Or maybe you are pastoring. Can God call you? You're going to go on record before God. I want you to come and stand. I want you to come and stand. I'm calling disciples. You'd say, I want to go on record. You're going to come and stand. My pastor, I give him liberty. Just like Elijah passed by and cast that mantle. Give him liberty. Pastor, no one can make you do this. No one can make you do this. But there's something powerful when you're totally surrendered and submitted to God and His will. Something, that's it. Obedience is so powerful. A lot of things are faithfulness, of course, carry a lot of dynamics, but there's something powerful when you say, like Isaac, here am I, O Lord, send me. Something about that that moves God in the arena of your life. I want you to pray with me. Who knows what's standing here? The potential. Cities, nations. Multitudes. Who knows? David had no clue. He's just a kid. But that day when that oil was poured on him, set him on a course. God's speaking to men. God not only knows your past and the present. Most people make decisions out of their past history and their present circumstance, but God knows the future. God not only knows where you're at, He knows where He wants to take you and what's waiting. I want you to pray with me. I want you to say, Lord Jesus. I go on record tonight before God, before my pastor, and this assembly. God, I make myself available to your calling, your purposes, your plans. God, I'm surrendering everything. I will not be diverted. I will not be turned aside by the cares of this world, the things of this world. But I, tonight, I surrender. God, here am I. Here's my life. Here's my future. My mind. My soul. My will. My energy. I lay it all before you. And I give my pastor liberty to talk to me about your call. God, give me a nation. Give me a city. Give me souls. Give me anointing for the glory of your name. I pray this tonight in Jesus' name. Would you give God praise? Oh, God, Oh, God, 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 lay your hand on these men. Oh, God, lay your hand upon these men. Oh, Ramamama, Shamdalalava, Rebo, Shebo, Rebo, Shikaya. 
see your pastor tomorrow say look look I, if, if possible uh, I, wanna, I want you to send me I want you to launch me or maybe go to your pastor I've had them come to me and say pastor I'm, I'm thinking I'm, I'm stirred about this and I say okay okay let me work with you a little longer let me there's still some things can I speak to you can I correct you can I talk to you about real issues And when they give you that liberty, man, there's an acceleration. But there are those here, God's already been dealing with you last night, today. You need to speak to your pastor and say, look, look, I feel God strongly stirring me to a city. Thank you for listening. God bless you, pastor, if you come. right where you're at amen let's close in prayer amen and uh how many thank god for pastor campbell amen Amen. grace of god amen Amen. wonderful word amen so lock that in your heart remember tomorrow uh prayer eight o'clock nine o'clock amen we have our first seminar uh bobby perez followed by uh renee barra and then uh pastor garrett amen wonderful morning amen so uh let's come with open hearts pastor mcginnis if you can raise your voice and close us in prayer amen Ministry. We pray, God, you would give us safe traveling. Bring us back tomorrow. We give you glory. Jesus.